It was, it's great to be here and see all of so many friends. Um, I, I have no, as many of you know, when you've seen me speak, I don't prepare any speeches or anything like that because I'm a bad reader. So I try to talk about things that I uh, care about and know about. I do have a couple of notes that I'll bring out in a few minutes. Uh, I've been asked many times, what's it like to serve on the town council? Well, it's kind of like serving you all. There's so many CEOs here who have made all their decisions on, on their own, whether they're right or wrong decisions, and they go get on with life. They you know, make a decision and that's it. Uh, being on the town council is not that at all. Uh, being on the town council means uh, you have to uh, get at least two other people to agree with you, and you try to hopefully have a unanimous vote on the important issues. And being town council president, uh, everybody says this is, you know, you get to set the agendas and everything. I, you know, that's, I set the order of things in the agendas, basically, and the agendas are the agendas. But I see my role there as trying on contentious issues of building consensus around things that we can all agree on. And, and so, therefore, I listen carefully to what my fellow council members say, and I parse through that and decide what we all agree on, and I identify those things, and then I talk about what we don't agree on, and we try to figure out how we deal with those. And I think as a result, we've had a lot of unanimous votes on some tough issues. But uh, it's, it's fun to be on the council in a couple of ways. Uh, yes, there's a lot of reading you have to do, uh, six, 700 pages for each meeting, although we've tried to cull that back. Uh, but that also qualified me, I found out, uh, because I recently became a trustee of uh, some of the Fidelity funds. And when we meet, we have 1,400 pages to go through for each meeting. So I've, I've learned to read quickly uh, and find uh, uh, and look through financial statements very quickly. But it's wonderful to meet all the people that Jeannie and I have met as a result of being on the council. We would not have met a third of the people that we've gotten to know who have become friends of ours, who we go out to dinner with, and whose company we truly enjoy had, we not, had I not uh, decided to run for the town council. Uh, that gives Jeannie and I the greatest pleasure of serving on the town council. I don't consider myself to be a politician because we don't have partisan politics on the town council. We're nonpartisan. We don't run as Republicans and Democrats. We run as individuals. But I do know who the Democrats are. I do know who the Republicans are. And therefore, I, I know on certain issues how they're going to view things. And so therefore, we, we have several three to two votes because of where we come from. Uh, I'm going to address a couple of things that I think you all, though, want to hear about. I'm sure you've all heard the news that the North Bridge is going to open sometime today. And the hope is it will stay open. Uh, the mayor and uh, Secretary Wolf had a press conference at Town Hall this morning at 9. I was sworn to secrecy yesterday afternoon that this is going to happen. I didn't even tell Jeannie last night until I <laughs> took an early look at the shiny sheet and there it was. <laughs> so I said, well, this is some big secret. Uh, but uh, the, the other good news is the Coast Guard is going to keep all the bridges on the same schedule they're on now, which means uh, they open, they stay closed, excuse me, in the morning and in the afternoon until December the 2nd, so through the holiday period. And the North Bridge, the Flagler Bridge, will only open once an hour because the Coast Guard has agreed with the DOT that perhaps the opening and closing of those leaves is causing some of the issues. So that will only open once an hour. I think it's going to be at the quarter past the hour. So that's very good news. And DOT is looking at re-engineering the, the, uh, the base of the foundations for those, uh, those leaves so that perhaps they, they won't have to do all the work as close as they're doing it to the uh, existing bridge. The next bridge that's going to be dealt with is going to be the Southern Bridge. And the Southern Bridge actually was the first bridge the DOT was going to deal with because it's actually in worse shape than the Flagler Bridge. 
Uh, but it's only a two-lane bridge, it, and so somehow, I don't know who made the decision. Uh, I, I, it was above my pay grade. But they, uh, they decided they were going to skip the southern bridge and move to the, and do the Flagler Bridge. And so there we are with that. I, I want to bring to your attention a couple of things, and this is why this island is so congested. Uh, first of all, everybody thinks we started all the, uh, uh, the public works projects in October especially the people who live on Everglades Island. Uh, they think everything started in October. Unfortunately, that's not the case. They actually started in the summer, but putting in force mains, putting in uh, underground power, which the residents are paying for, they wanted it. Doing all of that took a lot of time. They're almost finished, so they should be gone. Uh, the other town projects, paving some of the side streets, are almost finished. FPL has constant problems on the island and they have to come in and replace lines and get dig trenches and so forth and so on. That's something the town cannot control. Same case with FPO, FPU, the gas company has put in a number of upgrades to their gas lines. Uh, we try to keep them from doing that during the season but if there's an emergency we cannot prevent that. So that's part of the congestion problem in addition to the North Bridge being closed. But if any of you ever sat at the either side of the North or Middle Bridge, or even the Southern Bridge, between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning to see the traffic, it's mind-boggling. I don't know how many landscaping companies there are, there are working on this island, but there have to be at least 200. And they each have three or four teams. So that gets you probably 600 cars. As far as construction, let me throw some facts at you. Lloyd Ecclestone isn't here, so I can't blame him for part of this because he was a big part of it in 2012. But in 2010, this is two years after the Madoff, it's, well, 2009, which is the year after, we had $171 million worth of permits pulled for construction on the island. 2010, it dropped to $115 million. This year, year to date, we're at $223 million worth of construction permits that have been pulled, new permits on the island. So that tells you something about what's happening here. The, the town has issued 9,275 permits this year. That's up from 2010, 77, 27. There are 26 new homes being built on the island this year, 25 as of last year. But you know what? Unfortunately, and I've, I've been opposed to this forever, we give, them, give everybody too much time to build a house on the island. So that means we have over 50 homes under construction right now. So that's part of the congestion and problems that we have on the island. Uh, moving from that, I want to talk to you about the PUD, PUD 5, and what I did and why I did it. Um, in the October meeting, I voted against the PUD, having voted for it in the previous meeting. And I did so because I didn't see anybody other than Ned and a couple of other people coming up and saying we're in favor of it. Nobody was showing up at the meetings. Well, Michael Pasillo made an eloquent appeal to me to rescind my vote. So we went through the procedure that you have to do, and I rescinded my vote. We had another vote, and I voted in favor of it. But I said, I'm going to vote opposed to this. I'll vote against it if at the next meeting we don't see people coming out who are in favor of this. I'd like to see them. I'd like to see them in public because all we see are the people who are opposed to everything. Well, once I got wind, and, I, and then I met with people. I met with NAPB. Uh, I was stopped on the street. I was called at home. I received emails and so forth. And those, by the way, are subject to a FOIA request we, I just received last week, uh, which I provided. Uh, the town, however, is going to go spend I don't know how much money to comply with this FOIA receipt, uh, re request. But um, I listened. And I listened to the people who were opposed to the PUD, and I listened to the people who were in favor of it. The people who were for the PUD were 
for it because of specific reasons. The, the cry I heard constantly was, too many condos, too many condos. The people who are saying that uh, thinks condos uh, are, bear a stigma in town. And um, the truth of the matter is that there are 33 apartments on that one block area, not including the hotel, which is the only landmark structure. If everybody were able to build using 10 units per acre, we would go up to 42 or 43 units, an increase of nine to 10 units. If everybody who wanted to build also put in underground parking, which is a requirement of the PUD-5, to get 13 units per acre, we would go to 49 units per acre, uh, 49 total units. So in the worst case scenario, we would go from 33 to 49, an increase of 16 units. Well, just down the street, I forget the name of the place when it was 60 condos, now it's Il Laguno. Uh, it, went, uh, it went from like 60 units to 12. Uh, the statistic I was able to get was we have reduced density in the town over the past uh, 10 or 12 years by about 400 units. So it's not like uh, we're suddenly adding a lot of congestion to the town by, by doing this. The other thing that the PUD does is it encourages the uh, the breakers to take their ugly little building, which is previously owned by the shiny sheet, with their parking in front, and to put, let them take that parking and move it away and move it across the street if they'd like to their existing parking lot, and put up some retail units in front of that and perhaps a park behind it. Because the complaint we hear constantly is everybody stops at that parking lot when they're walking west on the street because they see the parking lot, they figure that's the end of the, the avenue. So th there are a couple of uh, businesses on the other side of the street that would like more traffic. Um, I've not spoken to Paul Leone about it. At some point, I will. The, the other thing that happens is all the curb cuts on the street disappear. And what's the real problem with curb cuts is that when you walk down the street, you have cars coming in and out. The only two places that can build 13 units per acre would be the magnificent PNC building, bank building, which I'm sure everybody treasures. Um, that could be converted into something that could, it could get to 13 units per acre. And Testas on part of their property could get to 13 units per acre, but not the entire piece. When you look at what the, the um, Pasillo Commission did, they basically preserved the facade of Royal Ponciana Way. And that's the thing that got to me when I looked at the alternative. The only two non-contributing buildings that could be leveled would be the bank and the gas station. Every other facade has to remain the same. On sunset, there are several contributing buildings also that have to be preserved. So, but if we don't have the PUD, and I, if, I were a business, if I owned a piece of property on that street, I'd bring the bulldozer in tomorrow. And you could level the whole street. And then what would you be left with? You would have to park in front of all those buildings. So the parking would be like is at the breaker's office building all the parking would be in front and the buildings behind. I don't think that makes for a good street. And the issue about three stories per, per uh, uh, on the buildings, there are only a couple of places where that can happen, but walk down Worth Avenue. There's four stories on Worth Avenue. Has that ruined Worth Avenue? It actually brings some charm to it by having a moving skyline. And the people who are in favor of the PUD actually brought facts to the table uh, made me change my vote at the final meeting. Now, we, uh, I'm pretty certain we'll have a referendum. The uh, uh, people who are opposed to it uh, will get 806 signatures by 
uh, December 13th. But that's, that's a given because uh, I know of several people who signed it, not knowing what they're signing, but they just wanted to get, get it over with. And so they'll get their signatures. The issue will be education and trying to take what the people who are opposed to it are saying and what the people who are for it are saying and put them on the same piece of paper and let the residents compare and then we'll have a referendum and they'll decide. <clears throat> so that's that issue. As far as this next season is concerned, I don't see anything looming on the horizon that's going to cause any consternation to anybody. Uh, there are no big projects coming forward. Uh, there are no big new ideas coming forward. Uh, it looks like it will be a pretty calm two years, in the next, next two years. Uh, we are floating next month a $58 million bond, and I take great pride in the fact that we're doing that. Because uh, four years ago, we were looking at a capital expenditures program of $80 million for replacing our 50-year-old sewage system, and we had lots of other financial obligations looming on the horizon. And the normal course of business for the town was to do that pay as you go. So each year our tax bills would have gone like this. And we would have, you know, one year see an $8 million increase to the, to the need for taxes. By the way, our tax, when you look at the town's budget of this year, I think it's $63 million, somewhere in there. Pat, is that right? 63? Um, $63 million. Only about 37 million of it comes from taxes. The rest comes from fees and fines and forfeitures and utility things. You saw in the paper today that we're going to sue FPU because they've not been giving us our franchise tax. So um, if we took our $37 million worth of tax revenue and added $8 million in one year to our need for taxes, that's a 20% increase on your Palm Beach taxes. Uh, I thought that was ridiculous. I thought that was a silly way to do it, especially since we're dealing with projects that are, have long lives. It, this project should last 50 years. So wh why wouldn't we treat it as a project that's going to last that long? So I encouraged the council four or five years ago to look at uh, long-term financing. And it was not an easy task, but we got it done. Uh, the... the um, and then the bond underwriters announced the day before the meeting uh, that the plan wouldn't work. And so I got that phone call uh, early in the morning. I immediately called up the, the bond underwriter and I asked to meet with him before the council meeting. And I went over his numbers and I found the error in his calculations as to why it would work. And he agreed. And so he presented the plan to the council, which we we incorporated, and we threw into that also the Worth Avenue improvement project, which is being paid for by Worth Avenue, and we refinanced the debt on the town hall because interest rates were so low. Why not take advantage of it? This year, the $58 million will take care of, and we accelerated, we accelerated the, the capital plan so we could get the pain over with earlier. Now, I know the South End was horribly inconvenienced a year ago when all that construction was going on back there, uh, or uh, down, down there. Uh, but it was better than doing it over a two-year period, and that's why the council decided to do it in one year. So this year, we're, we're now almost three years ahead in our capital improvement project, and that's terrific. We've saved the taxpayers a lot of money over the term of the debt our interest rates are just a little north of 4%, but over the term of the debt, and by spreading it out, it means that all of us don't have to pay for it on day one, but the people who follow us will continue to pay for the improvements that are there for them also. So I think that was an important change in philosophy at the council, and I'm delighted I played a role in that. Uh, I would love to ask if you have any questions of me. I'll take them and try to answer them, but... Richard. Frank, you said in the paper about the dredgen, uh, you know, the make deeper and everything. I just was wondering your feeling as to how you think it could affect us in case we have a serious hurricane or a serious storm. I think it, could, it, it would be bad. Um, 
what they want to do for those who don't know it. Uh, the Port of Palm Beach and the Civic Association has fought this. Uh, the mayor has fought it. I, when I, when, uh, under the previous mayor, uh, since he didn't take an active role in all the things that were going on in town, I, I actually went to the meeting along with other council members and we objected to the program. What they want to do is be able to take in 1,000 foot long container ships into the Port of Palm Beach. Right now the limit's about 700 feet. In order to do that, they've got to have the, the channel deeper and they have to make it wider. The first issue in all of that is I think the homes that are on the channel in the north end could be negatively impacted by what they're going to have to do to make the channel deeper and wider. The second impact is you're going to have a much bigger area for sur storm surge to come in, which is going to impact the island. I mean, we see it now when we have these super high tides, part of the lake trail is, is got water on it. And the town doesn't have the money nor the, the, the will to raise lake trail. Uh, when you build a seawall today, you have to build it to a certain height, or it's not a seawall, a, a, a break, a bulkhead, you have to raise it to a certain height. Currently our standards are seven and a half feet for homes that are built. So we're trying to do all that. But if they build that, if they put that channel in, we're going to have much more traffic, bigger ships. They do create wakes. I live there and I see it at my dock and I watch my boats after a big container ship, a 700 foot container ship goes in or out or the carnival thing goes in or out. Even though they're going at a slow speed, they do create turbulence and we get wakes that come and affect us. So I think it, it, it the Port of Palm Beach is desperate to do this. And Congress recently passed a bill, which was strange in and in of itself that they actually passed something, uh, to fund $458 million worth of port infrastructure, but it doesn't include the Port of Palm Beach. But they're, they're trying to get the Army Corps to agree with them to do this. So, any other questions? Michael. Is uh, seven and a half feet enough? We're now on four elevations, and do you see it uh, changing? I do see it changing because I, I, um, I brought it up um, as we were talking about this. I think we're going to have to raise the minimum to eight feet, uh, maybe even higher. But um, I, I think seven and a half feet is, today is marginal. Any other questions? Uh, wait, Bill? Uh, I have your same concerns about the support of foundation. And, you know, they're, they're interested in the economics. And we're interested. We're, they're interested in the economics of bringing in larger ships. And we're interested in preserving Palm Beach Island. And who's who can, who's going to win in, in this effort? Or do we have to, you know, really get legal representation above and beyond? We may very well have to do that, uh, Bill. The, the, the issue is uh, the Army Corps will, is the ultimate decision maker. They're doing a study right now, uh, an environmental impact study. It's the first phase environmental impact study. It's not the final one to determine whether this is a feasible project. I think it's unfe not feasible because the port doesn't have the capacity to take care of 1,000-foot ships. The 700-foot ships they have there, and I go by there on my boat periodically. I just went by there bringing my little sailboat from Cracker Boy, and they had a 700-foot ship, and it was, took up the entire dock. So I don't know where they're going to put a 1,000-foot ship. So, but the port commissioners are the ones you have to lobby. Now, we have one representative, um, uh, uh, Mr. Mastic, who's on the Port Commission, he's totally in favor of this project. Uh, he has to be lobbied hard. But I think ultimately uh, the state will have to be lobbied on this because the state is in favor of getting more trade here. The other part of that consideration though, Bill, is that in order to make this feasible, they're talking about bringing the railroad line down to the port and bringing, I think it's State Road 27 down to the port in order to use an inland port. So it's, it's 
much more than just widening the channel. Thank you all very much.